So today's event, uh, Meeting the Moment is what we called it. And, and you're really in for a treat with our presenters, especially in today's time as we ramp up for the election season. Um, definitely gonna be very relevant for all of you. I, it's my pleasure to present our, our speakers for today. Uh, our first uh, speaker that I'd like to present is, is Jean Tom. Jean is the leader of uh, Davis Wright Tremaine's tax exempt practice in the Bay Area. She co-chairs the Attorneys of Color Affinity Group at her firm, uh, somebody I've known for some years now and, and rely on for great, for great counsel to, to many of my clients. And it's a pleasure to have her. She's been named one of the rising stars in nonprofit law, frequently speaks at many conferences and events, and uh, very involved in many uh, tax-exempt organization committees, whether it's bar association or, or other organizations. It's also my pleasure to, to have our other guest speaker today, David Lawson, who is uh, a, an expert here on uh, political activities and advocacy. He's counsel to Davis Wright Tremaine and really uh, a key expert for their firm. Uh, he focuses on a lot of issues, whether it's governance or compl complex transactions, compliance, or um, anything that impacts a nonprofit organization. He too is also a frequent speaker and is involved in many organizations, whether it's hospitals, research organizations, arts and culture, um, foundations, and more. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. So um, just wanted to quickly run through what we're gonna cover today. Um, we're first going to, as I mentioned, level set and give you the rules of the road as a nonprofit tax exempt organization, really focused on um, 501c3 organizations, although we will touch briefly on C4s and C6s. So, you know, what are the different forms of advocacy? What's allowed, what's not allowed, and what's allowed within certain limits? Um, David, my colleague, is gonna focus on lobbying. Um, what the rules of what does it mean to lobby? How much can you engage in? And how does it differ as between um, being a private foundation versus a public charity? Um, and then I'm going to take you through the rules of political campaign intervention. Um, while you probably know that it's prohibited for all 501c3 organizations, private foundations and public charities alike, there are lots of questions about how is it defined, what are its contours, and then what, when does your permissible advocacy on an issue actually start to shade into impermissible political intervention? Um, and then also what limitations, if any, are placed on you as an employee or a leader of a 501c3 organization from engaging in these activities in your private life. Um, after we run through the rules, we're going to try to bring the, uh, the rules to life through a few case studies that we've prepared. You know, you'll, you'll probably um, note that they're sort of ripped from the headlines or they're sort of fictionalized versions of issues that we've encountered with our, our clients. Um, and so um, can we go to the next slide? And before I hand it over to David, I think I just wanted to start, though, with this definition of advocacy. Um, there are lots of definitions of advocacy out there, and, and this is one of them, that advocacy is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. Uh, and based on this definition, you know, all of our nonprofits are, in fact, engaged in advocacy of one form or another all the time, because your organization has, a, has to have a charitable purpose, which is the cause or mission that the organization is promoting. So, so broadly speaking, nonprofits are by definition meant to engage in advocacy um, by, by according to this definition. So then the real question is identifying the specific kinds of advocacy that might have specific rules or limitations so you don't run afoul of them um, or you can use them to your maximum advantage. So that's what we're hoping to equip you with today so you know what kind of advocacy is permissible because certainly everyone wants to be engaged in it right now. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to David right now to start uh, walking us through the rules governing nonprofits and lobbying. David? Thank you, Jean. And I'm very pleased to be here and appreciate uh, Daniel and um, BPM extending the invitation for us to present today. So this part of the presentation is going to be concerned with lobbying. And before I get into the tales, I, I want to just sort of put up some guideposts. We are going to be presenting today on the, non, on the lobbying aspects of federal tax law. 
that applies to tax exempt organizations. And as Jean said, that is really centered around 501c3 organizations, but we also have some content in here related to C4 social welfare associations and C6 business leagues trade associations. We are not covering today because this could be multiple other presentations. Um, state laws that may um, have some impact on lobbying activities. This is especially true in California, but also in other states where we may have attendees, including Oregon, Washington, and most other places will have separate state rules that govern lobbying that often intersect in ways that are filled with tension with the federal tax rules. But for today, we're really covering the federal tax rules, what limitations there are under, um, under the federal tax rules and what the reporting implications are for federal tax. So this is a broad overview of the situation for tax exempt organizations engaged in lobbying, which is defined as attempts broadly as attempts to influence legislation. And we'll get into that definition in a minute. It has quite a few wrinkles. But in any event, let's talk about the broad framework first. So if you are a Section 501c3 organization, which look like most of our attendees are, then the set of rules that applies to you depends on whether you're classified as a private foundation or a public charity. Private foundations are generally prohibited from um, engaging in lobbying activity. Um, there is a limited exception for grant making, uh, general support grants to public charities, uh, even if those charities lobby, are not going to be considered lobbying by a private foundation. Um, and we'll get more into this second item on the bullet later in the presentation about how to cover projects that involve lobbying um, without having that attributing, uh, that lobbying attributed to your private foundation. Public charities are permitted to lobby. Um, and the limit here is one of two. There are two different tests for how much lobbying you can uh, engage in. One is just derived from the language of Section 501c3 itself. And it says you can lobby so long as lobbying is not a substantial part of your activity. That is a very vague standard, obviously. We don't know exactly what it means. Um, we have some general guidelines, which I'll talk about later. If you want more specificity, that Section 501h of the code is available, which allows an organization to make an election to be governed by a specific formula, which allows spending on lobbying up to a certain percentage of the charity's budget, which is between about 10 and 20%, depending on the overall budget. And we'll get into exactly what the, uh, the definition, uh, uh, or what, the, what that formula is later in the presentation. If you are a C4 or a C6, you can lobby all you want, as long as it's furthering your purposes. Um, limitations for those organizations are on political activity, political campaign activity, which Gene will get into later, but they can lobby all they want. So let's talk about exactly what lobbying is. Next slide, please. Um, so we have this definition from the tax code, which I don't find tremendously useful. We'll get into more details though. Carry on, carrying on propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation. The key here is influencing legislation. Um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about lobbying by exempt organizations. And then we have, that gets us into regulations um, that are under section 4911 of the code that define a lot more clearly exactly what it means to try to influence legislation. And we'll get into some of those details in the next slide. Next. So the first question is, what is legislation that you're trying to influence? And this is a broad definition. Um, it's almost anything that a legislative body does. A legislative body 
is a legislature at any level that includes everything from your town council up to Congress and everything in the middle, city councils, county councils, state legislatures, those are all legislative bodies. For federal tax purposes, legislative bodies do not include things like special districts, um, if you have special fire and water districts in your area, if you have a regional transit authority in your area, most notably school districts, none of these are included as legislative bodies. So attempts to influence them are not lobbying for federal tax purposes. This is limited to legislatures um, such as city councils, councils, state legislatures, and Congress. Another big piece of it is that the public can be a legislature. We are here on the West Coast. This is the heartland of direct democracy and initi uh, initiatives to the people and also referenda, um, direct up or down votes by the people on legislative action. Um, if you have a ballot measure, um, then for purposes of these rules, the people are considered the legislature. And so lobbying can include trying to lobby the people on ballot measures, initiatives, referenda, et cetera. We'll get more into some odd implications of that rule later, but for now, just know that the people can also be a legislative body. Um, this does not just include bills um, or ordinances before a city council. It involves anything that the legislature is doing. So we have a prominent example right now uh, that you may be thinking about. We have Congress about to take very swift action um, on a likely Supreme Court nominee that will probably in a couple of days. That is legislation under the federal tax definition. And in most cases, attempting to influence the um, approval process for the uh, Supreme Court justice will be lobbying. Um, it also includes, I had a client who was bitterly disappointed to find out that an attempt to influence legislature's action on its own rules would be considered lobbying. And this also applies to treaties and other nominees that executive branches may put forth that require legislative approval. Um, so we've already mentioned legislation does not include actions by special districts. It also does not, for federal tax purposes, include actions by an administrative agency. Um, sometimes communications with the executive branch can be considered lobbying if the purpose is to affect legislation before the legislature. The biggest example of this is when you're trying to influence a proposed budget that would be submitted by the executive branch to the legislature. But administrative action by the executive branch itself is not something that is legislation for the purpose of the lobbying rules under federal tax law. Ne uh, next slide, please. So the next question after what is legislation is what does it mean to try to influence legislation? And we get into this distinction in the slide here, direct versus grassroots lobbying. These are two different ways under the federal tax code of trying to influence legislation. So we'll start with direct lobbying, which is an appeal directly to somebody who has influence um, with respect to the legislation. That can be a legislator. Um, it can be a legislator's staff. As we mentioned, it can be an executive branch official if the purpose of your communication with that executive branch official is to influence legislation. Um, so you have to be communicating directly with someone involved in formulating that legislation. One thing I should mention is that most of the time, unless you're giving them preferential access to it, writing something in a newspaper that is intended to catch the eye of a legislative official, for instance, that won't be a communication directly with a legislative official for purposes of determining whether it's direct lobbying. So you have to be communicating with an official. Beyond that, there need to be a couple of specific things in your communication. One is that 
you have to be referring to specific legislation. That doesn't necessarily mean a bill with a bill number. It can mean a legislative proposal, which can mean something that the legislature might be thinking about. For instance, if you say, I want you to look at a bill that would completely reform California Prop 13. If you say that to your legislator, you are influencing legislation, even though there's no such bill in the legislature right at this moment. Um, you would, you would uh, be influencing legislation because that would be considered a specific legislative proposal. You have to also rest a view on that proposal. If you just say, if you say to a legislator, I find this bill interesting, can you send me more information about it so I can learn more? You're not expressing a view. If you say, I want you to try your best to get this bill on the vote, get this bill on the floor for a vote, or I want you to vote for this bill, then you're expressing a, bill, or a view. Or if you say, I want you to vote against the bill, you're expressing a view. So in short, direct lobbying is a communication with legislators where you're referring to specific legislation or legislative proposals and expressing a view. Now, grassroots lobbying is a completely separate category of attempting to influence legislation. And this is when you are trying to get the general public to do the lobbying for you. So we're gonna have more specifics in the next slide, um, but in general, it refers to specific legislation, which is again defined the same way it is for direct lobbying. It reflects a view like direct lobbying but it includes a call to action and it's communicated to the general public. Next slide, please. So what is a call to action? What brings something into this grassroots lobbying category? There are four answers and I'm going to run through them specifically because they can be surprisingly specific. Sometimes it's harder than you might think to make calls about whether something really is grassroots lobbying or not. Telling the recipient to contact a legislator. You see this all the time, call Senator Smith. Tell Senator Smith you want him to oppose the bill. That's a call to action, that's gonna be grassroots lobbying. Listing contact information if you express a view. If you say this bill is terrible and you need to call Senator Smith and stop there and do not say and tell him to oppose the bill, that's still grassroots lobbying. It's clear what you're trying to do there. If you provide a petition, and this can be either an online petition or it can be um, a hard copy if you have postcards or if you have little tear off slips um, with the legislator's phone number from a flyer, all of that stuff is direct lobbying if you're enabling people to contact legislators. And this is the one that can be tricky. If you're expressing a view about legislation, and you identify legislators, legislators who are gonna vote in their position. Even if you don't have anything that suggests you should call, even if you don't include a phone number, that can still be grassroots lobbying. So if you're communicating with the public in your communications efforts, and you say a legislator's name, that is sort of a red flag to say, oh, maybe there's some grassroots lobbying here. And worth noting again, um, we don't want there to be fear out there that you're engaged in lobbying when you're not. If you have one of these calls of actions, if you just publish an op-ed that says, we like this bill and we think it should pass, and you're not directly communicating with legislators on the one hand, and you're not issuing a call to action to the general public on the other, that's not lobbying. You can publish all the op-eds, all the flyers, all the mailers in support of legislation that you would like. Uh, next slide, please. So coming back to this issue of what you're doing when you advocate on a ballot measure. Um, so usually you think of talking to the public and you think of grassroots lobbying, but where the subject is a ballot measure, initiative, referendum, levy vote, then you're not grassroots lobbying anymore. Then you're talking directly to the legislators because the legislators are the public. So 
if you are communicating with the public, urging them to um, accept or reject a ballot measure or expressing a view on that ballot measure, that is direct lobbying and not grassroots lobbying. Um, so next slide, please. So we have some exceptions. Once you're in this world of lobbying, direct or grassroots, my experience is that usually people make use of these exceptions more in the direct world, but they apply to both. Um, once you're in this world of communications that name specific legislation and express a view on it, there are um, categories of communication that won't be lobbying even, they, even though they do those two things. Um, there are four of these exceptions. Probably the one that I see employed the most is nonpartisan analysis, study, or research. If you have a policy-centered organization and it studies this topic all the time and it knows the topic inside and out and it produces a broad report that um, looks at everybody's position, exposes the facts fully and fairly, um, gives an, uh, the, the short end of the, the short version of this standard is it gives enough information to allow people to see both positions on a matter and understand the arguments for both positions. If you do all of that, you may have nonpartisan analysis study or research known as NARS for short, and you may not have lobbying. This is usually used by, again, policy-led organizations that are accustomed to producing white papers and policy reports that go into the nuances of particular issues. So then sort of on the other side of the coin, you've got another exception, which is examination or discussion of broad social, economic, and similar policy issues. This one um, is really about big problems and potential big solutions to big problems. Um, and it may suggest a, at a high level solutions that might look like legislative proposals, but at the same time, you can't get too deep into the weeds and still count here. You can't address the merits of a specific legislative proposal um, and you can't encourage action on particular legislation, but you can say, for instance, we have a widening inequality problem and as a general matter, an effective solution to this would be to have higher marginal tax rates on extremely high incomes. But then you couldn't go and say, and Senator Smith has a bill that would do that. So next slide, please. So the other two exceptions to lobbying are a bit more um, obscure, and I won't spend a lot of time about them. But if the, if the legislature has a proposal before it that would threaten the existence of your organization, its tax exempt status, or its uh, power to advance its purposes, then you can communicate with the legislature and advocate views in self-defense. This is fairly narrow. Um, I think it is good to check with counsel before you rely on it. And then the final one, I have seen this used a few times for organizations that have extensive expertise in particular issues. If a legislative body comes and asks you to testify in writing um, and asks you for technical advice, then you may be able to rely on this technical advice exception. But the key thing is you have to have a written request um, from the legislative body. And I usually advise my clients that this should be a request from the chair of a committee before which they're gonna testify. Um, or alternately, if it's being delivered privately to one legislator, um, a written request from that legislator um, to provide advice. Next slide, please. So I promised you to talk a little bit more about Section 501H. Um, this is the election you can make that allows you to be governed by a specific limit on expenditures for lobbying rather than the very general no substantial uh, part of your activity test. 501H is, in my experience, best for medium-sized organizations um, that are big enough to have the uh, capacity to track their expenditures accurately. Um, 
but small enough that they don't run into this absolute limit. If you have more than 17 million in annual revenue, the limit is 1 million no matter what. So as you get to very big organizations, that quickly becomes a minuscule part of um, the budget. And those very large organizations are typically best served by not electing under 501H. If you're in this band though, especially around one to $5 million, you can get 20% or close to 20% out of this formula of your budget that can be spent on lobbying. And that's a fair amount. And it's nice to have that certainty if you are lobbying, that as long as you're within this expenditure limit, you're not going to be lobbying in a way that threatens your Section 501c3 status. You apply to be governed by Section 501H by filling out a Form 5768 and submitting it to the IRS. Once you do that, once you are governed by 501H for that tax year and for all subsequent tax years until you submit another Form 5768 that says, I don't want to be 501H anymore. So we often submit the with exemption applications for new organizations. But if you're not, if you are in a mid-sized category and you have not filled out one of these, it may be worth looking at whether you should be governed by 501H. Next slide, please. So if you are governed by 501H and you go over your um, designated lobbying amount, you will be subject to 25% excise tax if it's an exceptional thing. If, on the other hand, you keep on doing this over and over um, and you exceed your, you exceed your uh, lobbying limit by 50% or more um, on average over a four-year rolling average, you're going to be revoked. Um, now, if you find yourself exceeding your lobbying limits in a single year, that's probably a good reason to get some advice. Um, it may be that you would be better suited um, to be a dual 501c3, 501c4 entity structure. It's not a position where you should be regularly. If you're a grant-making private foundation, and assuming that you're not going to get yourself in trouble by directly going out and talking to legislators, what, when do you have to watch out for a grant that might be considered lobbying uh, activity attributable to your foundation. So let's talk first about general support grants. Um, these are the grants you can make to any 501c3 public charity um, for, for other public organization as defined in the regulations. This is where either you don't have a grant agreement at all, which is fine in those cases, or you have a grant agreement that says something very general, like this to be used for general support. Good news is if you're giving a general support grant, that's not gonna be considered lobbying, no matter how much lobbying the recipient public charity does. So a general support grant, um, to the extent you can give them, is a great way out of this problem. And if you know that you're funding an organization that is a public charity and that's likely to be involved in project work that may involve lobbying, if you can give them a general support grant, that is a great way to keep yourself out of trouble. I find that a lot of private foundation clients have a strong bias against ever granting funds not subject to a grant agreement, but if your grantee is an appropriate recipient, um, there is no legal problem with that, and it can be a good way to make sure that specific project activities of the grantee are not attributed back to your foundation. So next, 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 um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean next slide. I was thinking about the next category on this slide. So if you're going to give a project grant and your project's going to involve lobbying, then you can consider a couple of things. One is does this work fall within an exception? Um, is it, you know, is, are you giving a grant that's going to produce a report that's a report on broad economic, social, or similar problems, or that is nonpartisan analysis, uh, research, or study? If so, then maybe 
you are comfortable that you're not actually funding lobbying activity. So then the next way to deal with this issue is to ask for a budget. If your grantee is providing you with a budget that breaks out lobbying and non-lobbying activity, then as long as you can discover um, within the numbers and then put a condition in your grant agreement, making clear that the project budget um, that involves, that, that the project budget that is for activities other than lobbying is more than you're granting, then you're okay. And this can produce a funny loophole where a public charity can go out and get support from multiple foundations for a project that involves lobbying. And as long as each foundation um, is funding less than the non-lobbying amount of the project, that actually works out. Um, and none of the foundations are considered to have supported lobbying. Um, you can do that though, that's fine. And then finally, the last options are to ask for a revised proposal or to put a provision in the grant agreement that uh, prohibits use of grant funds for lobbying entirely. Um, you, some foundations do that for every grant agreement, but you don't have to. Um, there are other solutions as we've gone through in this slide. So that's, um, that's sort of the end of this topic. I think now we are headed on from lobbying to the scarier terrain of political campaign activity, which Jean is going to cover for us. Thanks so much, David. Um, I know there are a couple of quick questions to you um, in the chat on, um, on lobbying, but um, I don't know if we want to address those now or um, maybe we'll save those for the end so we have enough time. Um, do you want to quickly address them, David? Uh, one was about um, um, asking you to repeat what you said about op-eds not constituting lobbying. Oh, sure. I can just do that one more time. So lobbying, is, direct lobbying includes communications with legislators. Grassroots lobbying includes a call to action for the people. If you publish an op-ed op that isn't directly communicated to legislators, is just in a newspaper of general circulation, and doesn't have a call to action, that is not going to be uh, either direct or grassroots lobbying. Next question, is there any educational work you can fund a C3 to do? Um, Yes, if you have, the, if you are funding a publication that it, you are uh, obligating in the grant agreement not to express a view on a measure, because remember, lobbying includes the expression of a view, then if you're, if you're funding something that is contractually limited from expressing a view, then it's unlikely that uh, lobbying will be attributed to you. I should caution that expression of a view can be more subtle than just saying, we think you should vote for this ballot proposition. If it's clear from the analysis that the analysis overwhelmingly favors one side, then that can be expressing a view as well. But if you just are publishing a summary of the ballot measure or something like that, then most likely that's not gonna be lobbying. Great, thanks so much, David. Um, so I'm going to shift gears now and take us through the rules for political campaign intervention. Uh, next slide, please. And the starting premise, as I mentioned earlier, is that all 501c3 organizations, be it private foundation or public charity, face an absolute prohibition on political campaign intervention. And this, this rule was introduced in 1954 by then Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, um, apparently, I think a nonprofit advocated against his reelection, and I think this was his way of, uh, of getting his revenge. So um, it's often been called the Johnson Amendment by some, and during tax reform in um, 2017, you might have heard people talking about wanting to do away with the Johnson Amendment. I think Trump wanted to do away with it in particular, so he thought that churches which are 501c3s, most of them, could engage in advocacy on his behalf for uh, re-election. Um, but he, the, the tax reform bill did not do away with it, um, uh, despite what Trump might think. 
Um, so 501c3 organizations still cannot engage in political campaign intervention without potentially jeopardizing their tax exempt status. Uh, this is in contrast to 501c4 organizations and 501c6 organizations, trade associations, uh, or 501c4 social welfare organizations. Those entities can engage in political intervention so long as it's not their primary purpose. Um, and they may also have to pay some associated taxes as part of their political activities. Um, but 501c3s cannot engage in it at all, um, even insubstantially. Uh, so that's uh, one very clear prohibition here. Next slide, please. One thing to note in contrast to the lobbying rules is that, you know, even though it sounds rather cut and dry, you can't engage in political campaign intervention, there aren't any really bright line tests or definitions um, uh, as there are in the lobbying realm. Um, it really relies on a tax lawyer's favorite phrase, it's a facts and circumstances analysis. So the IRS is going to look at a whole range of factors when considering whether or not you've violated this prohibition. Um, and we'll get into those factors as well. Um, everything from the specific words to the timing of the communication to the issues you're focused on. So um, we'll get into that. But there are a few key terms that are defined. First, you need a candidate, and then um, which is defined as someone who's holding themselves out or is even being proposed by others as a candidate for elected public office. So they don't actually even have to be declared yet. You know, when there's campaigns to get people to run for office, those are already considered candidates. Um, and then you also need a public office and the characteristics are um, supposed uh, to be, it's an office that's defined by statute, it's continuing, it has a fixed term and it requires an oath of office. Next slide, please. Then you need an act of intervention by the nonprofit. Um, and there's no one key um, definition, fixed definition of intervention. Uh, but from the rulings and guidance, we do know that intervention includes the following. Um, obviously, publicly endorsing or opposing a candidate or making statements in favor or opposition of the candidate. So this, that clearly violates the prohibition. Um, more subtly, you know, rating a candidate's fitness for office. Um, uh, you know, if you were to say that, you know, this slate of candidates is unfit for office, that would be a violation of the prohibition. Uh, financial contributions to or in support of a candidate. You know, you would think um, it would be pretty obvious that you shouldn't do that out of your nonprofit's coffers, but you might remember that the Trump Foundation made news um, uh, a, a few years ago when it made a $25,000 political contribution to the Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi's campaign, which she then um, you know, publicly had to return. So that would, it, don't do that. Um, and then um, any sort of other educational types of activities, issue advocacy activities you might engage in that reflect a bias, um, either a bias for a particular party or a particular candidate, you know, even if it's ostensibly educational, it can still be considered political campaign intervention. Um, also allowing a candidate to use your organization's assets or facilities if you don't make that same offer available to other qualified candidates, um, that will also violate um, the prohibition. And then, you know, as I mentioned, facts and circumstances, any other action that has the effect of promoting or opposing a candidate. Um, there are areas, though, the IRS has said that don't in, uh, constitute um, impermissible intervention. So nonpartisan voter registration drive, you know, that's political, um, and a lot of our clients have been asking about that, but, you know, if it's truly nonpartisan, you know, if you, your organization were to set up a table, um, you know, at, I guess, pre-COVID uh, at a state fair where um, you're trying to get citizens to register to vote and you don't provide any names of any candidates, um, you just list the date of the upcoming election and an offer to register there, um, you know, that is totally permissible um, uh, nonpartisan voter registration. Um, contrast that though with um, an example um, that the IRS provided where um, say you're doing um, uh, 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 phone registrations or you're calling all the, um, rather a get out the vote 
campaign and your organization focuses on environmental issues, say there's a candidate running for state legislature and an important element of her campaign is challenging the incumbent's policies on the environment, um, and then you, you run a phone banking operation where you call all registered voters in the district in which that candidate is seeking election, and you tell all the voters about the importance of environmental issues, and you ask for the voters' uh, views on those issues, and if the voter you're speaking to happens to agree with the incumbent's position, you quickly get off the phone, but if they um, agree with the, the insurgent candidate's position, you remind them about the upcoming election, you stress the importance of voting, and offer to provide transportation to the polls, that would be political campaign intervention because clearly you're evincing a bias for one of the candidates. Um, I do wanna note here also for private foundations um, who want to fund uh, uh, voter registration activities, there are some very specific rules um, that you have to meet if you want to earmark a grant for that purpose, um, including, you know, the activities have to be nonpartisan, of course, but they have to be in five or more states and occur over one, um, more than one election cycle. So just if you're a private foundation thinking of funding voter registration, um, uh, please be aware of that. Okay, next slide, please. So just a little bit more about, um, you know, what kinds of nonpartisan educational activities are, are permitted. And, you know, here are just a few examples. Um, uh, voter guides, candidate questionnaires, publication of voting records and candidate forums, um, all can be done in a way that are permissible, but they can also be done in a way that's impermissible. So again, you know, back to looking at all the factors. So, Generally speaking, the way to stay on the permissible side is to be truly even-handed and neutral and nonpartisan and evince no bias or preference for any of the candidates. So, you know, you can think of like some of the League of Conservation Voter Voter Guides. Um, you know, it, it usually requires the educational materials to cover a broad range of topics so that it's not comparing the candidates to one narrow issue that your organization clearly has a point of view with respect to, um, because you know, you're effectively maybe then drawing an even uh, implicit comparison to your organization's views and, um, and, and that candidate's views. So um, you know, when you do see organizations, I guess um, historically like the NRA, that does have a clear point of view and a rating, those are 501c4 organizations. They're usually not 501c3 organizations. Um, you know, similarly, voter guides, if you want to publish the voting records of incumbent legislators, you know, you can distribute those with the stated purpose of educating voters, but, you know, some of the facts and circumstances that the IRS has said they'll look at to see if it crosses the line into prohibited activity is, you know, were the incumbents identified as candidates? Were their positions compared to the positions of other candidates or the organization's own position? Uh, the timing and the extent and manner with which the voter guide is distributed, you know, are you distributing it just to Democratic voters or to voters of all, um, all parties? Um, as well as I mentioned earlier, the breadth or narrowness of the issues presented in the guide. Um, I also, on this list here is also inviting candidates to speak. Um, so you can invite them either in a candidate capacity or a non-candidate capacity. So imagine they're an incumbent legislator and you want to invite them in that capacity. Um, if, it, if you're inviting them in a non-candidate capacity, you need to make sure that the event is not, um, doesn't turn into a political event and you know, hopefully doesn't mention their candidacy no political fundraising occurs and um, you know, nothing is done to promote their candidacy at that event. If you're inviting them in a candidate capacity to speak, it's really crucial that you invite and provide an equal opportunity to all political candidates seeking that same office. So um, you know, there's an example of um, you know, a church um, or an organization inviting one candidate to speak at its well-attended annual banquet um, but then inviting opposing candidates to speak at, you know, a sparsely attended general meeting, that is uh, considered a violation because clearly it's not giving an equal opportunity um, for, for um, all, all qualified candidates to, to reach your audience. 
Um, and then also, you know, I think it, it, it usually helps that, um, you know, disclaimers, they won't save you, but um, there should be, you know, statements made or demonstrations made that, you know, you're not indicating support for or opposition to any specific candidate who's appearing there. Um, and then, you know, with forums, if you want to have a, a candidate forum, similar to the guides, it's best if um, the, the candidate, the, the questions are prepared by an independent nonpartisan panel. The topics should cover a broad range of issues. Each candidate should be given an equal opportunity to speak and present their views. Um, you shouldn't ask them to agree or disagree with issues or platforms of your organization. And, um, you know, the moderator obviously should not um, uh, imply approval or disapproval of any particular candidate. Um, so those are some of the factors that IRS will look at. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, as already alluded to, uh, there are ways in which a nonprofit's pushing for an issue can start shading into impermissible electioneering, particularly during this period of time right before the election. And I mean, it, it's tricky because a lot of nonprofits are smartly seeking to capitalize on the greater attention being paid by the public uh, during campaign season to elevate their issues or promote a policy agenda. Um, and, you know, and that can be fine. Um, the IRS has said that, um, you know, you can certainly take, continue to take uh, position, public positions on issues, even on issues that divide the candidates. Um, but you really need to be careful of whether your issue advocacy is really effectively functioning as political campaign intervention. So, um, you know, and the IRS has said that even if you don't expressly come out and say vote for or against a specific candidate, um, you know, you should look for implicit messages and code words. So, and also if you don't identify a candidate by name, are you showing a picture? Are you referring to them? Um, are, are you uh, alluding to their political party or parts of their platform? So all of these things need to be considered. So, you know, imagine a broadcast ad taken out by a public health 501c3 that states the following in, in these coming weeks. You know, do you want this pandemic to end? Do you wish our national leadership promoted universal mask wearing? Send a message on November 3rd, vote for candidates that truly care about our health. You know, what do you think? Um, so these are the kinds of tricky line drawing questions that some of our clients have been reaching out to us about. And so, you know, here are just enumerated some of those factors. It's really a kind of a weighing test um, that the IRS will look at. You know, whether the communication identifies a candidate, either directly or indirectly, whether it expresses approval of a candidate, whether you make reference to voting or the election, whether it's delivered close in time to the election, whether it's one of those wedge issues that distinguishes the candidates, whether the communication, this is a, a savings factor, whether the communication is part of an ongoing series of communications that your organization has been making, regardless of whether an election is taking place. Um, and then also another savings factor is whether the timing of the communication relates to a non-electoral event, like a legislative vote or some other event that's totally unrelated to the election. Next slide, please. So, and then a final thing I want to emphasize because we've gotten a lot of questions about this is that, um, you know, what does your work for a nonprofit do to your ability as a private citizen to advocate for particular candidates um, in the upcoming election? And I think it's, it's really important um, to emphasize it shouldn't. Um, you uh, do not give up your First Amendment rights to um, speak out on political issues just because you work for a nonprofit. Um, but there are important um, things to be aware of. Um, so, you know, particularly, um, you should not, as a leader of a nonprofit, um, uh, make partisan comments in official organizational publications or at organizational functions. Um, so you need to make sure it's clear when you're speaking in your individual capacity or in your official capacity um, for the organization. Um, so you need to probably take pains to, um, you know, take off your organizational hat and, and say, you know, these are my personal views. Um, so for example, you know, people saying on their social media accounts, you know, these tweets are mine um, and not the organization's, 
that can be helpful. But but you know, then again, that doesn't necessarily save you if say it's usually a, an organizational social media account. So so just generally, you know, be aware of using your organization's financial resources, facilities, intellectual property, or personnel for indi your individual political activities. So people should not be engaged in these activities on company time. Um, although, you know, in COVID, that's a little harder to determine. Um, they, they shouldn't be using their organizational emails. That's an important um, reminder or social media accounts. Um, and, you know, they should take pains to uh, make clear that the actions or statements are theirs um, and not those of the organization. And sometimes it's helpful you know, if you're if you're writing a personal op-ed, say, and people know you as the executive director of a foundation, to say, you know, organizational affiliation for identification purposes. You're not speaking for the foundation. So we have a uh, we have a slim plurality in favor of it being lobbying, but political camp intervention. On the balance, I think that's the right answer. Um, it's not cut and dry, though. So all of you who answered um, in favor of it being political campaign intervention, you got a point. So this is definitely lobbying. We are holding a rally in support of a ballot measure. And that's direct lobbying, because what we're doing by doing that is communicating with the legislators on the, the legislators on the ballot measure, who are the public, and telling them to vote for it. And even before the rally, we authored and placed on the ballot this initiative. And it's gonna be clear then what our position is on the initiative and that we're communicating and expressing an opinion about it. So chances are that this public charity will need to report everything it spends um, on this initiative as direct lobbying which is fine as long as it's not over the applicable limits. The interesting question here is whether this is political campaign intervention. And can I get the uh, next, next uh, two bullets, please? And uh, as I mentioned, that was direct lobbying. This is, is this political campaign intervention? There is an important factor here, which is that it is not a defining issue in the campaign. But nevertheless, since we've got candidates that are divided on the initiative, there may be other factors that come up during the rally or in the larger context. Are we naming any candidates? Are we telling people what the candidates' positions are? That could potentially tip the scales and make this political campaign intervention, even though the fact that it's not a defining issue suggests it's probably not political campaign intervention. So let's tweak this case study a little bit. Next slide, please. So second rally. This one's late at night. This one's without a permit. It's against a local curfew. And it devolves into violence and property damage. So what's happening here? Um, Next bullet, please. So I agree with this result. It doesn't change the lobbying political, uh, lobbying or political activity status of the activity, but next bullet, please. Yes, there are other tax exemption issues here. Next slide. So we have something in tax exempt uh, law called the illegality doctrine, which holds that illegal acts are per se related to a section 501c3 organization's exempt purposes. This is risky for an organization. If it engages in illegal acts, they will dis it, those acts will disqualify an organization if they're more than an insubstantial part of activities. There's both a qualitative and quantitative analysis to determine when that's true. The issue in this scenario is that it's unclear whether the activity should be attributable to the organization. I, I, this is a borderline case, in my opinion. On the one hand, the organization did not encourage people to engage in illegal activity. On the other hand, there are a lot of risk factors that the IRS could point to and say, come on, you guys knew this is what was going to happen. And 
we didn't rise to the level of revenue ruling 75384 because we didn't sponsor civil disobedience, but I would not be in a comfortable position advising an organization to hold a rally that where the circumstances indicated it was likely to become an event with uh, extensive property damage and curfew breaking. I suppose we did tell people to break the curfew, so that could potentially get us into illegal act territory. Next slide, please. So here you have your permits, local officials know about your, your uh, public activities. And this, this bullet is super important. Be clear about expected behaviors. Um, this includes making sure you're consistent with public health guidance about COVID-19. It also includes making sure that you have a written record that you are telling people not to engage in property damage or curfew breaking. Um, so these are, especially in this era when we have a lot of street protests that have had violence around the fringes of them and a lot of eagerness by some to make a lot a big deal out of that violence. I think it's important for organizations to protect themselves this way if they are organizing public events. Next slide, please. So one more scenario here um, and go ahead with the, uh, oh, this is, this is the voters, this is the voters guide scenario. So here we're detailing research and policy positions supporting the ballot initiative. And the question is, is this nonpartisan research and study for purposes of lobbying? Um, I would say probably not because we're not describing the positions on both sides of the ballot initiative. Is it political campaign intervention? Well, so far we're not really engaged in we're still in the same scenario with respect to mayoral candidates that we were before. So I would say no. Next uh, bullet or slide. Thank you. So now we're getting into interesting territory. Um, the op-ed in support of the ballot initiative by the CEO. I would want, if I were the CEO, to put a disclaimer saying that I was speaking in my personal capacity but not in the capacity of CEO. Forgive me for moving fast. We're gonna go on to the next one because we're almost out of time. Is this political campaign intervention? In this scenario, probably not, but keep moving. Next one. So now, oops, it's clear that the CEO wrote the op-ed in the office during business hours. They're using charity resources. Now we're getting closer. Uh, so these are the sorts of facts and circumstances that we have to consider when determining whether something is political campaign intervention. And now on to the next scenario, which Jean will present. Great. Thanks, David. So here's an, another example where the public charity, which is a non-profit um, health organization, um, has been consistently engaged in efforts to raise awareness regarding the dangers of COVID-19 and ways to flatten the curve since the onset of the pandemic in March. Um, and these efforts include public communications in support of the governor's stay-at-home order. The stay-at-home order is not legislative. It's an executive order through, through an executive branch um, agency. So therefore it's not lobbying um, because it's not a piece of legislation. Um, it's also not, you know, we don't have any facts here indicating uh, that we have an election issue. So we don't have political campaign intervention either. But let's go to the next slide. So, okay, um, let's alter the facts a little bit. Um, another nonprofit healthcare organization has been treating COVID-19 patients, and it hasn't engaged in any significant public outreach regarding the pandemic. But six weeks prior to election day, they launch a campaign in support of the governor's stay-at-home order. The governor is up for re-election and the governor's chief opponent has been a vocal critic of the stay-at-home order. And uh, the incumbent governor's response to the pandemic is seen as a key issue in the upcoming election. Well, I think, you know, you all can probably predict the outcome here. Um, can we have the next bullets? 
political campaign intervention? I would say yes. Um, next bullet. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, the factors we're looking at are, you know, no history of advocating for this issue. The timing is six weeks before the election. It's an issue that divides the candidates and it's a key issue. So I think on balance that would tip towards potential intervention. Um, I'm going to skip this alternative facts um, because I, I know we're running out of time. I want to go to our final case study. Um, David? Yeah, so this is the last case study. So private foundation this time. Um, so we've, we're under a different set of rules. Wants to encourage its employees to be civically engaged. And as a starting matter, that's fine. Private foundations can do civic engagement. So we have a variety of questions about what the private foundation can do. So let's go through them. First question, please. Can the private foundation give all of its employees a paid day off on election day? Absolutely. This is the, the paid day off is part of employee compensation. As long as the compensation is reasonable, there are no issues there. This is not any form of political campaign intervention or lobbying. Next question. Give all of its hourly employees a paid day off on election day, but not its salaried employees. Um, I think this is fine as well. As long as there is not some indication that somehow that would put a big big, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, thumb on the scale for one side or the other, which seems pretty implausible. This seems fine too. Next question. Regularly circulate messages to all employees regarding the employment, important voting and information regarding how to register. This could be a voter registration drive. Private foundations have specific rules around voter registration drives that either they conduct or they fund, and chances are very good that this would not meet, the, um, meet those specific requirements. So regarding the importance of voting, that's probably all right. Um, information regarding how to register, uh, there we've got a potential compliance issue. Next question. What if these messages emphasized how election day results could impact causes pertinent to the private foundation's mission? So chances are very good that this is political campaign intervention. Even if this sort of message does not name a candidate specifically, there is a very good chance that looking at all the facts and circumstances, you could quickly gather from context how the private foundation is advocating that it, its employees vote and that chances are good it's supporting one side in a message that it's putting out. So that is going to be difficult and it's likely to be political campaign intervention. Great. Um, next slide, please. We just have a couple, you know, just final um, tips, practice tips on you know, how do you avoid um, entering that red zone of avoiding political um, intervention. So first is you know, focus on your issues, not the candidates. Focus on, um, you, know, you can use this moment to promote your issues. Don't go focus on, well, if this candidate gets elected, that will be good for my issues. Um, that's when you start shading into the, the, the danger zone. Um, additionally, be mindful of the timing of issue-oriented materials. Um, you know, the closer we get to the election, the more it feels like electioneering. Um, another thing is, you know, be cautious about any links you provide from your website to other websites, say, of those of candidates, um, as well as of your social media activity. You know, it, it, there's no guidance yet on, you know, what does a retweet mean? What does a like mean? But, you know, you can try to draw some inferences. Um, review your voter education or plan voter registration and get out the vote activities for any bias. And then, um, you know, as we already stated, have some policies in place limiting the use of company time and resources for political activities, including personal political activities. Next slide, please. So once the election is over, um, what can you do? You've got, you're not, you're not engaged in political campaign intervention anymore, most likely, because there are no, can't, no longer candidates to try to elect or not elect. What can you do to avoid lobbying 
engage with new with members of the new administration you can absolutely do that as long as you're not talking about specific legislation talk about broad policy issues social or economic problems recommending individuals for appointment as long as you're not recommending for legislatively confirmed positions commenting on the results of the election this is counterintuitive but it's absolutely fine to comment on something after it happened and so you can comment on the results and you can advocate for changes in the election process as long as you're conscious that if you're advocating something that has to be done by the legislature it may be lobbying finally protest as long as it is peaceful and lawful is permitted next slide please so then there are also things you know even though the election is over there might be activities you would engage in that still suggest that you are intervening so um, say, you know, a candidate, your candidate has, uh, the person you support personally has lost. Um, and so um, they, if you continue to support them or oppose them in a way that sort of, you know, they're talking about like, you know, run again in two years or four years, you know, that um, could, could constitute impermissible um, campaign intervention. If you say took credit for an election result, um, uh, say in an op-ed, um, you know, that could suggest that you intervened in a way that um, um, in that prior election uh, that could undermine your nonpartisan status. Um, and then also indicating, you, you can certainly indicate that you would hold an elected candidate accountable for policy issues, you know, um, uh, but if you suggest it that you're going to do so um, referencing a future election, you know, we're going to vote you out next time, you know, that could also be impermissible uh, political campaign intervention. 